Hey there, it's Olivia Savannah here from Olivia's Catastrophe and today I'm here to tell you about the first lot of books that I read in March. In March I read 24 books and I'm here to tell you about them. I'll have content warnings in the description box down below but without further ado, let's get right down to the books. So the first book I want to tell you about, I actually have a reading vlog about it, and that is The Tea Dragon Society by Kay O'Neill. This is a really cute, very short graphic novel where we live in this world where fantasy creatures exist and these tea dragons exist that can make tea. This young child kind of gets involved with the tea dragons and it's about what happens when she does and when she discovers them and I thought it was absolutely so very sweet. It's really wholesome, it's got found family vibes to it and the colours are so bright and colourful and lovely. It's got wheelchair user rep as well so if you just want a heartwarming cosy graphic novel this is definitely one I recommend and I'll leave a link to the vlog down below if you want to hear a bit more about it. I also read Losing the Plot by Derek Owusu. This is a book that is long listed for the Jalak Prize so I really wanted to give it a go and I'm Unfortunately, I didn't really like it. So this one is telling the story of his mother. So he's a black boy who's Ghanaian British, I believe, and he's kind of telling the story of his mother moving to the UK and kind of what follows and what happens. It's written in this like prosy blend with verse and poetry, and it just wasn't working for me. This was really a case of me not connecting to the writing style. I just felt like the author was trying so hard to be poetic that it just ended up too vague and I couldn't actually understand what was happening in the story, which is so important when you're reading a story you need to know what's happening you need to know what is unfolding and because it was just so abstract I was always questioning what it meant rather than being able to enjoy the story and it did not work at all for me that said I think the footnotes were so much fun because in the footnotes he kind of adds his own perspective and his own childhood messaging to the story that the mother is going through and he does it in his own very casual very conversationalist writing style which kind of has the and that just worked so well for me to make it a more authentic story and I kind of wish the whole book had been those footnotes and been that kind of story rather than what we ended up getting so unfortunately this was just a big miss for me. But after that I read Death Note volume 6 and this was a new favourite five stars from me. So this is the sixth one in the volume so I'm sure you've heard this before but Death Note is a manga series that's set in Japan and it's a world where these gods of death exist and one of the gods of death gets bored so he drops his notebook down to earth and if you write the name of that person in that notebook then they will die and it comes into a hand of a student who decides he's going to start putting criminals on trial and saying whether they should or shouldn't live himself and it's what happens after he makes that decision after the police and detective get involved and this series is just so very good I've already seen the anime of it all and in the last two volumes I've been feeling a bit meh about the story it kind of was not as exciting and it was kind of dragging out too long and I wasn't feeling the thrill that I tend to really enjoy from the books but this volume brought us right back up to speed and I really really enjoyed it. I think it did a good job of showing, I'm trying to talk about this without spoilers, but I think it did a good job of showing two characters working together who don't typically work together and what it can really look like when they put their brains together and really optimize in their knowledge and their foresight that they bring to the team. I thought it was very suspenseful, it's kind of all building up to this one moment and once it gets there it's all go 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 so it just it just did the build up to that suspense and the payoff for it so very well and I also just tended to really like the way that the secondary characters were involved in this and the humour. There is a light sense of humour in this manga series and it really comes across in this particular book so I had a great time with the suspense with the like brain game, the psychological game behind it and the humour and the way everything unfolded. I just think this volume was perfect, it was the perfect length that it needed to be and I am such a Misa Misa stan, okay? I think she gets a bad rep because of the anime but in the manga she's smarter than she looks, she's more manipulative and yes she is silly and yes the female representation in this series is not the best but Misa Misa I love her sense of style, I love what she's doing, I love her dedication and how she gets whatever she wants. Go girl. 
I read The Family Upstairs by Lisa Jewell. I seem to be on this quest to become a thriller reader and it's not particularly working in my favour but I keep trying and I read this one and it was a good time. I, I enjoyed it but it just went a step too far for me. So The Family Upstairs is based around this mystery where there's one house, two families and three dead bodies as it says on the cover. It's pretty much that straightforward. So what happens is the police just enter this house and they discover that there are bodies, three adult bodies on the ground and there's a baby in a crib and this baby in that cot is just alive and well and although the bodies are days old somebody has been looking after the baby because the baby is still alive and healthy and happy. So it's like what happened and that's what you're discovering in this book. You get different points of view and it is so so suspenseful. When I was reading this for the first 75% I was blitzing through it. I was having the best time. I was like this is changing my whole perception of what it means to read a thriller. I think what Lisa Jewell does here stylistically that I really love is that she doesn't write the whole book in short sentences. I think thrillers are really known for those short staccato sentences that build the suspense but she kind of uses them sparingly. She uses them in the moments where you need them and that just elevates the suspenseful moments all the more but it's still, she still has room to take her time with setting up settings, setting up characters. So even though we follow uh, quite a wide range of characters in this I would say they all felt very individualistic, they all felt very well developed and I could get a sense of all of their personalities. So I liked the characters, I was impressed by the writing and the plot was go, go, go straight from the get-go. I was so intrigued. I think having a timeline that was set in the past and one set in the present really worked for this story and seeing it all come together and the first few plot twists because I don't think it's a spoiler to say this plot twist because this is a thriller. It's kind of what you go in expecting. So the first plot twist and maybe the first few I was just like wow revelation revelation this is amazing it did not go in the ways that I expected it to go and then we got to the last 25% and it just went overboard it just went overboard with the plot twist it just kind of veered into the realm of I don't really believe that that could all happen to this one household and I just it lost me I couldn't suspend my disbelief that much it just went way too far and I think it can be said that thrillers could be more effective if they dialed things down a bit and held things a bit closer to their chest a bit and sadly that fell into it. So I wouldn't say this is a bad book, I would say I had a good time and good fun reading it but unfortunately it hasn't cracked it to be a thriller that I really really enjoyed all the way through quite yet. I then tried How to Train Your Dragon by Cressida Cowell. I really like those three films that we have of this series and I've always been curious to try the original especially as I've been in my middle grade reading era this year. It just seems to be what I'm enjoying reading and I thought this was fine. I think it's a bit different when you go from having seen the films which are fantastic to reading the book because they are so startlingly, startlingly different. They've really done something very different from the film so I don't really want to compare the two but it's set in this time where there are Vikings and dragons exist and one of the markers of getting into the tribe or into the community is as a teenager you get your dragon and you tame it and the way that you do that is kind of a bit brutal in some circumstances in some ways and Hiccup our main character decides that he's going to try and take a softer approach or he feels like he needs to take a softer approach so he's quite different from the way that things are traditionally done and he's quite different as in he's not really violent he's not very barbarian in nature he's more of a thinker he's more quiet he's more calm and I do like the kind of themes running through this about it's okay to break down these age-old traditions if they're no longer serving you and it's okay to be different and to admire the pieces of yourself that you want but I was just so disappointed in the dragons I just I did not like these forms of dragons the dragons in this can talk which is a bit different than the films if you've seen them and I just I didn't like toothless I didn't like the dragons and because of that it was like half the story was gone for me I could like the themes but it just didn't capture me and I think part of it is also the writing style. This is very Diary of a Wimpy Kid-esque but fantasy but with dragons and I have never been a fan of Diary of a Wimpy Kid. As a child I hated those books, as an adult books in that style just don't work for me and this is that but with a fantasy touch to it so it just, it just was a miss. Okay so my reading clearly went up and down 
this month. I didn't realise how much, but I read Luster by Raven Lilani and I really didn't like this one either. I struggled with it. I struggled with it a lot. So this one is about this young black woman and she gets, she starts dating this white man who's in an open marriage and things escalate quickly and somehow she ends up living in their house and this white couple who have an open marriage have a been fostering and taking care of this little black child and she's now in the house in the mix and it's like what happens when that happens and to me that concept sounds really really interesting you get to examine what an open marriage could look like and whether that open marriage is actually a thing that can work or not work for these particular people and then you also see this like black child who's trying to grow up with white parents and what that dynamic looks like and everything about this story in terms of the concept is something I would be really interested in but the writing style put me off it's very crude sense of humor and it's a crude i don't even think it's a sense of humor it's just a very crude and very random writing style that absolutely threw me right off the hook and i just could not stand it i couldn't stand it i think there were things that were supposed to be sarcastic or dry or witty and when they were said i was like no that's just uncomfortable no that's just disturbing and it just was like the undertone of everything and it didn't work with me i had to switch to audiobook to finish this book because it's not that long and I was so in interested in the concept and seeing where the story would end and actually in terms of story I was quite satisfied I was quite satisfied with seeing the way the family dynamic went and the relationship dynamic went and the conclusion of the story the story itself I wouldn't say it has no faults but it's interesting enough that I was like I could read this if another writer had done it in a different way so I just struggled with this too much writing style wise and I know I would have DNF'd it if I hadn't switched to audiobooks so I could not recommend it and I really wish a concept like this in terms of like the open marriage and what it's like to raise a black child as a white family and what it's like if you are going to be like dating an older white man as a black young woman I'd be curious to see all of that handled in an entirely different book. I then treated myself by reading some poetry by Akwaiki Amezi. I've been loving Akwaiki Amezi's works and I just want to consume them all and drink them into my body. And there was nothing different about their poetry. It was just as lovely. So this poetry collection is a combination of two forms of poetry I would say. There's some poems sprinkled within this that have a bit of a religious depiction to them which if you know Akwaiki Amezi should not surprise you. Akwaiki Amezi is someone who sees their spirit and their presence as a sense of godliness, that kind of confidence. And that is kind of depicted in these poems where they're imagining themselves as someone who's related to Jesus and Mother Mary. So like if Mother Mary was like your best friend's mother, as is Jesus being their best friend. And then like if you had a relationship with Magdalena or something like that. And that bringing the very saintly religious figures down to a human contemporary level and also the rising of themselves into that godly figure at a contemporary level was just so creative to me and so inspiring and the way those poems were handled and the subject matters they tackled really really worked for me and I also really like their writing style in these poems there's some poems where they play around with form and the ways in which you read the poem those are usually typically my favorite kinds of poems so it was really nice to see them in here and there's some shorter ones some really succinct poems some of those worked for me some of those didn't so I had preferences in terms of the poems within the collection but overall I really really enjoyed it and I think a quakey mezzi can also write poetry they seem to jump from genre to genre and each one they do exquisitely well I will say that the poems that had more of a sexual like nature or imagery to them didn't actually work that well for me in this collection but that's fine. I still had a very good time. So I read Fire Fire Lane by Kristen Hanna. This is my second Kristen Hanna book and I loved it. So this one is about two women who become friends as teenagers in the 60s, I want to say, 1974. Okay, never mind. In the 70s, so 1974, these two women become friends and it's about their two lives. They're very different. One of them's an introvert, one of them's an extrovert. One of them's really daring and one of them's quite reserved and they just grow up and they both go and do the different things they do in their lives and make their different choices and it's literally about that. So I can compare this to a very well known, very famous film and if I do, I will spoil the book because you'll know what it's about and you'll know the outcome but 
was just so lovely to see that female friendship and have the female friendship be the center of a book. I keep yammering on about how I love reading books about women who are friends and it's just true. There's something so beautiful and so heartwarming about seeing it. And even though this is a friendship between two people and it's not like a group, I do believe that this book has found family elements because in some ways this friendship is a family to one of them and it's just lovely. It's just so lovely to see. It's got a few references in it and I think those pop culture references are more so to situate it in the historical period. So think mentions of like certain types of music, think mentions of things like the Waltons and even though I did not grow up in the 1970s, I have parents who did and so I managed to like get and understand those references and it kind of felt a bit nostalgic to me because it reminds me of my own childhood because I grew up around those things too. I think the ending ended in a very satisfying place and even though it's mainly about the friendship and I can't say that the biggest drama has ever happened in this book, I think there was enough drama for it to keep going. I do think at points it got a little bit repetitive there. They kept going through some of the same loops of um, conflict and resolution. I do think that's realistic to friendship sometimes and I do think this book for what it is for what the synopsis is it did not need to be a nearly 500 page book there's like 470 pages in this it could have been shorter can i really complain about the length though when i ate up this book in a week and i didn't want to do anything but read it i don't really think so so for me this is just one of those books that fulfill my heart that are super sweet and are super lovely and i think i can return to it and just enjoy seeing that friendship unfold for its highs and its lows i've read two christine hannah books now and i've enjoyed them both so I guess I can say I'm a fan and will be reading more. Oh, I get to talk about another one of my five stars. So I read Like a Charm by Elle McNichol and this was my first time reading Elle McNichol. Will not be my last because this was a new favorite and I absolutely loved it, five stars. So this is the first one in a middle grade series. It's middle grade fantasy. I did tell you I've been loving this genre. And in this one, we follow a little girl who has dyspraxia and she is always being treated a certain way for having dyspraxia. And she's kind of fed up with the way that the system, the school system and some people treat her because of it. And then she discovers that she has this ability to see things that nobody else can see. And by things, I mean fantastical creatures like vampires and werewolves and sirens and all of those magical creatures she can see them and I would say it's an urban fantasy in the way that these creatures live among humans in the real life but they cannot see them so they just perceive them to be other beings and there seems to be a kind of divide happening in this world they seem to be oppressed by some sirens who seem to be ruling over everyone and havoc is happening and because she has the ability to see between both worlds the human one and the magical one she kind of takes it upon herself to help solve this issue and see what's really going on underneath the surface. It's also while she's recently moved to Edinburgh and it is just, to me, I thought this book did the perfect balance of dealing with its contemporary subjects, its contemporary storyline and its plot and seamlessly blending it with the magical elements and making it make sense but also making it its own plot too. I have never read a book where the main character has dyspraxia, I've never seen that representation in it and this book calls that out. It talks about how she feels when she's looking at books and she cannot see herself in them. It talks about what it's like to always be treated as certain way by certain teachers and I just loved how this is a young child but she is burning with anger she is burning with rage about the injustice that she sees in the way that she is treated and sometimes also the injustice that she sees around her but as is so realistic she is a child she has these feelings she has that anger she has that sadness but she also has moments of happiness and she doesn't know what she can do to make changes in the way that society views her that's just too big a topic for her to handle but across this book she kind of gets a better understanding of that that does not lessen the fantasy elements to this because the magic in it i loved it i loved seeing some people develop their own understanding of their magical capabilities and it's become settled in them. I loved getting to meet the creatures like the vampires and the sirens and all of the other things that you get to meet in this book. I think the world building was done very effectively and I just really loved getting to adventure and explore with her but also to see the ways in which oppression was kind of trickling into the magical world too. I think it did a very good job of having a complete story arc, a complete storyline and finishing at a full stop at the end of this book. 
but still leaving doors open for there to be a sequel. I think it's the perfect setup as the start of a series. I will definitely be reading the next one and I'm so excited to read more Elle McNichol in the future. The next book I read was an adult fiction. That is The Pachinko Parlor by Elisa Shua Dusipin. And I read this in a day. I just consumed it. And even though I've got not that many similarities with this main character, I felt very, very seen with this main character. So we're following our main character who is in Japan for this story and she is going to be tutoring a young child. She's staying with her grandparents and her grandparents only speak to her in a Korean because she has Korean heritage, but her Korean is not that strong because she's grown up and spent her life living in Switzerland. So she's grown up in Switzerland, she's got Korean heritage, she's currently living in Japan with her grandparents who will only speak to her in Korean and she is tutoring this young Japanese child and her grandparents run a pachinko parlor and the young child that she is looking after has a lot of interest in this pachinko parlor. Now the reason why I felt so connected to this book is because even though I love reading books about identity, even though I love reading books about culture, they usually focus on being of two cultures, of being American but living in the Netherlands for example, or of being Afro-American and dealing with those two sides to your culture, your heritage and your background. Often it's two countries but this one threw in the mix three and that's how I personally feel. I've got Jamaican heritage, I grew up in the Netherlands, I'm currently living in the UK and I'm actually British so I've got those three nationalities, those three experiences living within me as a physical being and she talked about what it meant to her to feel like she has Korean heritage, to feel like she understands and feels natural within the Japanese community but also she can speak fluent Japanese and she can't speak fluent Korean for example but she's also got the French from being from Switzerland and that's where her parents are and just Grappling with those three identities is really prevalent in this book and I thought it was explored in such a really good way It's a very short book as well, but it manages to convey that Encapsulating of what it means to be of so many identities and I think a lot of this book is also dealing with communication And you can see the difference between the communication that she has with the child that she's looking after and the child's mother has with that child You can see the communication that she doesn't have with her grandparents and the communication that she does have with her parents And in some ways you can see the communication she's having with herself in trying to figure out who she is and what she wants She's in a long-distance relationship. Where does she want to be? How does she want to understand herself and portray herself to other people? All of these really big questions are distilled into a very short, succinct book. It also does a very good job of using imagery. So the image of the pachinko parlor, the setting of that is a key thing in this. And sometimes she focuses on certain items and describes them in such a way where I feel like the author is talking about something that's much bigger than the object that is getting described. I don't know how to put this in a more coherent review, but if you like books like Ruth Ezeki's A Tale for the Time Being, I think you can take away a lot from this and this is also translated fiction it's translated from French and then the last book I'm going to talk about in this particular side of my wrap-up is a middle grade book it's Ghost by Jason Reynolds and this is the first in the track series which is a four long book series thank you for everyone who told me it was four books and I had a very good time with this Jason Reynolds has not failed me yet he writes really good books this is a middle grade contemporary about this track team and there's this young black boy who is labeled as trouble in his school he's always labeled as trouble he's from a background where he doesn't have a lot of money his mom is working a lot and he watches this track team and he's never really considered it as something he's interested in but he just thinks I could do that better than those people are doing and so he kind of ends up unintentionally trying out for the team and I just love I just love a book with the found family it's my favorite trope and I think sports books that have a team element to them really bring that found family vibe for me and this one did that as well. So even though track is an individu individualistic sport in some ways, the fact that you're part of a track team just encapsulates that found family vibe. It talks about what it's like to be a black boy from a lower class growing up in America and the way that the school treats him and the way that people treat him, whether they are adults or children. He's also kind of grappling with uh, something that happened to him in his past between his father and him and his mum and father and him. And he's kind of working through that while also working through joining a team, people having expectations of him, people trusting him and not trusting him. 
He's just kind of figuring out who he is and trying to work through some trauma and run in this track team and make friends. And it was really lovely to see. I think Jason Reynolds does a good job of capturing the voice of a child, not in a way where I think it's difficult for adults to read, but in a way that, yeah, he does things and doesn't think about the consequences sometimes and only can look at them in hindsight. But also children sometimes have this really direct insight and not everyone can understand that and you children can be so misunderstood because other people don't understand that and this book did a good job of showing it. I really liked a particular character who is in the track team. His name is Sonny. I love him to bits. He deserves the world and his book is the third one so I just want to kind of skip there but I'm going to try and read the second book next before I do that. So that's all for this side of the wrap up. Please stick around, hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss out on part two of my wrap up. Please let me know in the comment section down below what was a book that you recently read and what did you think of it. And yeah, I've kind of done things out of order so I'll just start my exit thing again. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, hit the subscribe button for more and don't forget to hit that notification bell to be updated every time I have a new video and you know what they say, onwards and upwards. Excelsior!